Kalispera. Uh, I, I feel really honored and privileged to be here in, um, among such an amazing group of speakers and such an audience. Um, I'm an economist. Economists tend to do two things normally. They also do other things. But uh, normally one thing that they do is they try to present data in a clean enough way so that other humans can understand this data. And the second thing that they do is they try to create stories, we call these theories, that connect this data. And why we need these stories is so that we can base uh, policy on them and forecasts. This is not a site that any of us uh, can be proud of. Basically, we see a country collapsing for almost eight consecutive years. And the unemployment is just a mirror image of the GDP. This is a country that uh, was not a third world country and still is not a third world country. In most metrics would be roughly in the neighborhood of 25th in the world. Now it has lapsed towards 35th. And it was one of the fastest growing economies in Europe for a long time, along with Ireland, by the way. The, the, the Greek economy has collapsed for one reason. This is almost a tautology to say, but this is because there has been absolutely no in investment coming into this country. Investment has collapsed in the, uh, quote, good years. It used to be at about 24 or 25 percent of GDP, and now it is at 10 or 11 percent of GDP, of a GDP that is 27 percent less. So basically, uh, the, the incumbent businesses are only investing only the bare minimum, just to stay um, open, and there has been no new money coming in. Now, there is no surprise that the economy has collapsed. Okay, this is in one way. There is no other way to read this. Um, I'm not going to bore you with numbers. However, it must be said that the economy got into this in 2009 with uh, some massive imbalances. This is what, in, in our language, we call the twin deficits. So basically, you had um, a budget deficit that, when it, it was all counted, was uh, at about 15.5% of your G GDP. But even more alarming, you had building a massive current account deficit over about 25 years. These are imbalances that could not be uh, corrected, and they had to be corrected, could not be corrected in easy ways. The recession was necessary, and I hope at least we can agree on that now in 2016. Um, however, we didn't necessarily do it the right way. You, you can break this into two periods. In, if you compare 2009 to 2014, basically, we, we fixed these two twin deficits, but we traded this off for a massive recession. Basically, we pushed the economy one side, and then the problem came out in another side. We traded. We didn't make this a better economy. We made it a smaller economy. Now, in 2014, we decided that we didn't have enough pain already, and we wanted to be more adventurous. So even this uh, temporary st stabilization, we decided that we want to destabilize. And uh, whereas the economy was bound to grow somewhat following that, uh, we got into more extreme situations of uh, closing our banks and uh, walking at the edge of the cliff just to get some more adrenaline. We did get, get this adrenaline. It was fun. Um, anyhow, it appears that uh, the, the, the last, the, but one column is the, the official forecasts. The last column is uh, our uh, uh, arithmetic at IOV. Uh, but it seems that the economy is now about to grow next year and the year after. Starting, however, from a much lower, smaller base. All right? Now, we have to, let's, before I proceed to anything else, you, you have to basically take the good with the bad. 
There were some massive successes. Many people, including some famous, world famous economists, actually were saying that fixing your twin deficits in a democracy cannot be done of that size, that you cannot really legislate pension cuts, pay cuts, tax increases without having a revolution. And they were wrong. Okay? The will of the Greek people and the fact perhaps that they trusted European institutions more than some Greek institutions uh, made this possible. All right, so we lost a quarter of our GDP, but we didn't jump off the ship. At the same time, we had very weak performance in the two areas where we couldn't afford to have weak performance, and that was investment and primarily exports. On the structural form front, there have been a lot of efforts, as Elias Papayuano was saying before, the term structural reform, metarithmic, actually just got an amazingly bad name for many reasons. Um, the adjustment has happened to a very large extent, but we decided to do it the hard way. So we made the economy adjust primarily through a very deep recession. So when you measure, I'm going to show you the numbers, competitiveness via unit labor cost, uh, we are almost there. However, we were really kilometers away from any sort of consensus about what country we want and how you get to there. So the public sector has shrunk in absolute terms, but not relative. However, administrative burden and inefficiencies are, are there. All right. So these are some facts. How you can organize your thoughts around these facts? There are many ways. Here are four. One is to really talk about these, the details of the Greek mnemonia, the adjustment programs, and focus on the details and say what was wrong there. All right? So you can actually start saying that more emphasis was put on the fiscal front than on structural reforms. On the structural reforms front, you can say that more emphasis was put on labor rather than on product markets. When you go to fiscal, you can also say more emphasis was put on taxes than on cutting expenditure. Okay? When you go to cutting expenditure, you can say that too much of that was horizontal rather than uh, increasing efficiency. When you go to taxes, you can then say, well, you shouldn't have raised the tax rates that much, but you should have fought uh, tax evasion. All right? So you can look into this and you add it up and say, well, we didn't do it all that great. And, you know, same on us, also same on the Troika. That's one story. Then you can say another story, which is you can start talking about the Eurozone architecture. So you have this massive uncertainty. Starting in year 2000, capital fled to the European periphery. When the crisis started, capital went to safe harbors. All right? And then you are left, you are a country that has no monetary policy, you have no fiscal space, and then somebody puts a gun in your head and you say, you have to change. Hard. You can also tell a story about low capacity to implement reforms, even if you want to implement. So basically, if you make the, the best person in the world, in, you put them in charge of a ministry, it is such a complicated system that it's really, really hard to implement. So that would be a management story. Let me focus on the fourth one, and I'm sure that you could come up with a fifth or a sixth, but just, you know, since I don't have time to talk about everything, let me focus on the fourth one, where my buzzwords here are going to be entry barriers and rents. Um, and Econ 101 textbook are going to tell you that uh, in economics, pe people are after profit, of course. There are two ways to get profit. One way is to be uh, innovating. Not just at one point in time, but to keep innovating. And why are you keeping innovating? Because you want to be better than the others. This way you make money. Another way to make money is to make sure that you have a protected quasi-monopoly situation where nobody else actually uh, is going to bother you. And in Greece, in my reading of the story, we had too much of the latter. This is not just for businesses that rather than spending on R&D, 
they, got, they were spending a lot of effort in fine-tuning one line in a law that would not prevent others from coming into their industry. This was also true, for instance, in universities where my colleagues, maybe even me, have been spending not enough time trying to attract people who are better than us, but spending a lot of energy making sure that others will not come so that they don't share the power. So this is the story that everybody responds to incentives, and the incentives were built in such a way that everything was inward looking. And the system was working fine, just fine. It was everybody was happy as long as money was coming from outside the system. And money was coming from out the system for many, many reasons, but this is not trying to, dis to discuss now. And then we got into a position where we had to change. Now, you have these behaviors that I described, and you could make a very long list. And then you come to a crisis where you have to think how you go from point A to point B. And part of my reading for why the economy has collapsed is that you have hit primarily the ones that were not protected in such a way. So if you call them the insiders in the system, they knew how to protect themselves better even during the crisis. So let me show some graphs. I'm going to break this into two little parts. One, show you some graphs about the pre-crisis situation. Then a couple of numbers about what happened during the crisis, and then I have a slide that says now, where I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to say. Um, all right, so the, the first thing is about GDP and productivity. As I showed you before, Greece was fast growing, okay, consistently and systematically. However, there was one dirty secret, that productivity was very low, over, the, over a long, long period, actually starting in the early 80s. This, after a couple of lines of analysis, also implies low competitiveness, so you, were, you, you, you had um, a terrible problem in your current account. Now, the next two bullets are about two myths that people actually that may not know everything about the Greek economy actually may believe these myths. Uh, there was one myth was the country was not investing enough. The other myth was that we were spending too much in the public sector. Let me explain what I mean by myths. The actual, the actual percentage of investment in total income was not low. It was actually at or even higher the European average. However, investment was primarily inward looking, especially in housing and construction. And that's not how you build exports, that's not how you build brands. So it wasn't that we were not investing, but partly because we didn't have the institutions and we didn't trust the system. The Greek families were just putting part of their money into building a house. They didn't have the way to direct this into internationally competitive industries. Now the other second myth, and that's why it was harder to tackle the public sector problem, is that we were just spending too much as part of our budget, uh, as part of our official GDP on, on, uh, on the public sector. If you look at the numbers, it is not actually higher, the official numbers, um, public employees times their salaries, um, it's not much higher than in the rest of, the, of Europe. But the complexity of the legislation, the own purpose, of course, uh, lack of clarity about what you can do allowed the public sector to have a humongous reach over the whole economy. So even if you are in the private sector, there was basically nothing that you could do if you didn't have to pay rents to the public sector. It wasn't just the salaries, it was all this more indirect, much more deleterious effect. Finally, I want to say something about what one can call the Eurozone effect. We wouldn't have fallen with such a big noise if we hadn't gone up gradually since 2000. Now, this happened in all the European country peripheries. I'm going to show you something. But for us, it happened in a way that was much harder to undo. It didn't happen, for instance, through mortgages. It happened through the public sector. And it strengthened these pockets of uh, what I called rent-seeking. 
So a lot of cheap money came into the country in year 2000 and forward, but rather than using this money to change the country, we, it was used primarily to strengthen exactly what was making this country go back. Some data to support what I was telling you. Um, so if, if you take growth, average uh, annual growth for Greece, let's say between 94 and 2007, for instance, for Greece it was 3.6%, much higher than Germany or France. We were growing. But if you decompose this and you isolate this one crazy thing that we economists call total factor productivity, this was a negative effect throughout during the good years. And what is total factor productivity? It says, if you give me capital and you give me workers, how good are you in putting these things together? Now, if you have a system where capital cannot really leave unproductive employment and go to more productive employment, if you have a system where you cannot fire people and then rehire them, this makes total factor productivity low, and this was a drag in the Greek economy throughout. This also showed to this big uh, current account deficit. It has been fixed since the crisis, but it has primarily been fixed by decreasing imports. So this worries me. Partly because if we need to grow more, at the very least we will need to import capital goods, machines, for the businesses. This lack of competitiveness was also demonstrated by systematically higher uh, inflation during the good years than my, our trading partners. And here is investment. This wasn't bad, but it was primarily inward looking, and then it collapsed because basically there was a full collapse of the growth model in the country. Invest for what? You didn't know what was happening next Monday. This was the other countries. Basically, this is current account, and it shows that in all the European periphery countries, capital flew in because of the, of, of the uh, more appreciated currency, they lost competitiveness. So you see a negative trend like here, and here you have the crisis, and now we are both, we, we are, everybody's fixing it. So you see that? But for us, as I said, it went primarily through the uh, public sector, which was much harder to undo. Now, during the crisis, we basically fixed this. Investment is collapsed, exports bad, and in terms of structural reforms, other than perhaps the first year, almost everything else that we did was because of the fear that if you, do them, if you don't do it, you are just going to, 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 to completely die. And that's, that's not a great way to run a country. So the adjustment in terms of competitiveness, in terms of prices, has been very incomplete because still we don't have open markets, but the adjustment in terms of um, unit labor cost has been almost full. We, we have recovered almost all of the loss of competitiveness since the entry to the Eurozone. Fiscally, we are now in, in, a, in good shape. Exports, ah, sluggish. And this is a worrying picture, it basically says your exports have been growing somewhat in volume, but not in value, which basically means that we are not selling internationally competitive stuff. We are selling primarily commodities. We are basically exporting because we can't do much else. Foreign direct investment, clearly we don't need this. We didn't need it during the good years. Why need it now? Um, OECD is going to tell you that Greece has been a champion of reforms, in many areas, that is true, but we are still in the overall ranking low. So we have been running, but not fast enough, also because others are running. These are some, some key markets. I don't have the time to go there. Opening up of professions has been a real battle. You know, people like that, I mean, we, 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 we all know people like that, right? I mean, we, we, all, we all know lawyers and engineers, and, 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 and university teachers and college teachers, and, and, and we like them. We, we may be one of them, all right? But if you really sit down and think, what was the um, effect that rent sinking, but some of these groups may have had on legislation? 
So you can measure, for instance, to what extent you have shift towards export-oriented sectors. Uh, but this is an econometric exercise. If you do the structural reforms, and especially in product markets, you are going to have a huge benefit. That's why I am cautiously optimistic. Starting from now, just one word, because Georgos is, is going to get upset if I say more than one word. <laughs> the economy ne needs new blood. So for instance, when you have the representatives of the industry and the representatives of the workers talking and negotiating, they do not represent the ones that are not working. They do not represent the ones that want to come into the country and invest, and they don't represent the unemployed. And these people, they need to be represented, they need to be added to the equation. Second of all, we do need to shift to a new growth model. And here we have to also say some bitter truths. For instance, as much as I may dislike consumption taxes, consumption taxes is a way to shift production abroad, I mean, to, to produce so that you export. Um, and perhaps when you're trying to think about the way to reform the system, I think it's important to be realistic. Countries, especially when they have been through such a hard time, they, they, are, they cannot just change now or overnight. You cannot just say you're going to change the education system, you're going to change the product markets, but you have to allow the ones that want to do well to do it. Um, so you have to fully simplify tax and public administration, and you have to do much better. There is a positive scenario and a negative one, and I'm leaving it here. Thank you.